Good evening, everybody. My name is Thomas Sheedy. Welcome to the Atheists for Liberty YouTube channel. Glad that we are continuing our streams as always, and glad that the frequency um, has uh, been continuing because, boy, do we have more people to showcase. Boy, do we have more ideas to talk about. And we want to listen to every single one of you when it comes to your suggestions as to who to put on, what we should discuss, um, and uh, what Q&A questions the platform afterwards, because some of you can get really, really creative. Um, but happy summer, everybody. I know, uh, you know, sometimes we, we space out when to have the streams, but it's because we've been getting quite busy at Atheists for Liberty, thanks to all of you. Atheists for Liberty, we're a 501c3 educational nonprofit organization that stands for free speech, free thinking, and freedom for all. We grow every single month and every single week. Thanks to all of you joining up, becoming members, following us on social media, and getting involved as volunteers. We appreciate it very much. And we really like to show our appreciation by continuing to grow this amazing streaming series. Not only does Atheists for Liberty defend enlightenment values, but we seek to learn from the greatest minds of the 21st century. And hopefully we're going to live up to it today as well by having on such an amazing guest, a guest that has been a frequent ally of plenty of our volunteers and staff over at AFL. And I'm very, very pleased to introduce him in just a moment. Um, Want to get a few things out of the way before we really continue. Um, our member of the week is Michael Leonaska. Be like Michael. He's a good friend of mine. Be like him and become a member of Atheist Celebrity today at atheistsforliberty.org. Just go to the homepage and click join now. It's right at the center of the homepage. It's people like Michael that make this show possible, that make our programs possible, that makes Atheists for Liberty functional on a daily basis. It requires contributions and it requires all of you really showing, not only with your time, but with your money as well, that we're doing a good job. And we like to hear any and all feedback and any and all criticism. So let's get to it. So we have a very special guest on today. Dr. William Irwin is a professor of philosophy at King's College in Pennsylvania. He's the author of several books, including The Free Market Existentialist and God is a Question, Not an Answer. In addition, he's the general editor of Blackwell Philosophy and Pop Culture series. Irwin's most recent book, published in April of 2022, just a few months ago, guys, is The Meaning of Metallica. Dr. Irwin, Welcome to the channel. Hey, thanks for having me, Thomas. Please call me Bill. All right, Bill. It's going to be a little hard since you got William there in the title, but oh, uh, wow. we should uh, change that. Yeah. But I, uh, I, I really do want to express my gratitude with you coming on. I want to give a shout out here. Um, uh, everybody should check out the Stoic Solutions podcast with um, our outreach manager, Justin Vakula. Um, Dr. Irwin has been on that show quite a few times and is a good friend, as as, as far as I know, of uh, of Justin's. And uh, it's thanks to the connections and staff here at AFL that we've gotten plenty of suggestions as well as to uh, who to have on. And Justin to, did say, you got to have Dr. William Irwin on. I'm going to get him booked for you. And we tried to figure out what what Thursdays in the week would work out best. So I'm, I'm very glad that we're now finally making this possible. Yes. Well, th thanks, Thomas. And thanks to Justin, who is not only a friend of mine, but is a former student. Uh, he uh, was a student at King's College where I teach philosophy. I, so yeah, Justin deserves you know more more than just that credit, and I really do appreciate everything he does. And uh, if it wasn't for him, this conversation might not be happening right now. Yeah. Um, so we've had on quite a few different guests. On you know, we we started the stream in October. We we most of the conversations, at least as far as uh, June of 2022 comes to mind, is about wokeism and the atheist movement and what happened there. You know, you'll hear. Everybody here will hear the same story uh, that I usually bring up because it's a very important one that relates to a lot of the stuff that we're doing. But I want to make sure that when we have guests on, we diversify what we talk about, the various different the various different things, because there are atheists of all different strides that we want to attract here at Atheists for Liberty. And we also have to keep in mind, too, that that there are more atheists, you know, in this world than the modern famous atheists of the last 20 years. You know, when a lot of people think of atheists in the 21st century, what do they think of? Richard Dawkins, the late Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, Daniel Dennett, Ion Hirsi Ali, um, Heather McDonald, you know, and those types that, you know, frequently are involved in, in the culture wars. Um, but atheism has existed before the 21st century. Atheism has been a phenomenon 
that you could argue predates religion. Um, and there have been plenty of thoughtful atheists throughout all of human history that I think this audience and this membership um, should be aware of and sh should do research, besides yourself, of course. Um, and uh, you and your line of work, sir, I know have, have done quite a lot of research on plenty of famous atheists throughout all of human history. And I would like to give you the floor to kind of, uh, I don't know, give a, give a very thoughtful recommendation as to who we should look up, who we should research from humanity's atheist past and why we should do all that. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, uh, the further back you, you go in time, the more difficult it is to, uh, to say if someone was truly an atheist or not, but it becomes pretty clear by the time you get to some figures in the uh, in the 19th century, uh, we have Feuerbach and Marx. And uh, for me, uh, I, I like the so what I call the good old atheists. Uh, we have the new atheists these days, and uh, maybe I'm a bit old and uh, like I can't get into new music. I can't get into the new atheists quite as much. You know, I appreciate it, but it's the old uh, the old tunes that uh, that get me. And and so for me, and and this is really. Uh, my entryway into atheism, I, I think of particular Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher, uh, and Jean-Paul Sartre, the uh, French existentialist philosopher. In fact, both of them could be classified as, as existentialists. And for both of them, uh, atheism uh, is a big deal. Uh, that, that's one of the differences, I think, with uh, the good old atheists as opposed to the new atheists, where it seems very cut and dry, at least that's my reading uh, of Dawkins and some of the new, new atheists. Oh, come on, there's no God and there's no big deal. Grow up and, and move on uh, seems to be at, at least the implicit message some of the time, whereas uh, Sartre and Nietzsche and, and their company uh, see it as a kind of a, a momentous uh, event uh, and not an easy thing uh, to deal with. And that follows my own personal history, having been raised Catholic and having been a, a believing Catholic uh, all the way into to high school. And uh, actually, I give a lot of credit to my, my Catholic education. I know not everybody has had the same positive experience I have had, uh, but I saw Ron Lindsay on your stream and uh, you know, he talked about studying with uh, Jesuits at Georgetown and uh, having his mind open to things. And that was certainly my experience at a, at a Jesuit high school in the, in the 1980s, where uh, I was taught uh, the theory of evolution and fresh, freshman biology with no punches pulled. And, and, and that really uh, shook me up about the God issue. And then in my sophomore year in theology, we did biblical exegesis and uh, you know, I learned about who really wrote the uh, the books of the Bible and why, and all the contradictions, etc. And so the approach was that of faith-seeking understanding. And I happen to be among those who lost the faith uh, along the way. And you know, I don't regret that. Uh, but you know, th there are mature uh, religious thinkers out there, and I've been fortunate to study with and and teach with a number of them uh, who think that a, a naive faith is not a faith worth having and that faith and doubt should go uh, hand in hand and companions together. And uh, so, uh, you know, the, the theory of evolution and then uh, the uh, critical study of the Bible were the one two knockout punch uh, for uh, my religious belief. And, and that sent me searching. And because uh, I, I couldn't find refuge in, uh, in my religion. Uh, I looked to philosophy and, you know, did some reading around uh, as a kid does and uh, discovered existentialism. It's so weird to think of how similar our backgrounds are in this regard, because I was also raised Catholic. Um, and then uh, I, I round when I peaked in high school, um, I was also questioning my Catholic faith quite a bit. Um, and taking high school biology was was a big one for me to see seeing the conflict already between science and faith. Um, uh, when I was taking biology, actually, the Ken Ham Bill Nye debate at the Creation Museum was being advertised. That's how, that's how young I am. I was in, I was taking high school biology in 2014, um, and uh, that that's when I really got to see faith 
and and science really come into conflict. And then not only that, I don't know um, how public you are with your background and where you were raised and, and where you kind of grew up. But we're also we uh, not that far from one another, at least when it comes to the places that we grew up in. And yeah, also, I grew up in, in New York area in Yonkers, and uh, you're a New Yorker as well, right? Yes, I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm from Long Island. Uh, yeah. And then to add on to that, uh, I, I I think this is public knowledge. You went to SUNY Buffalo. Um, yeah, for grad school, right? My father went to SUNY Buffalo for okay. the first year of his undergrad, and yeah. the first atheist conference that I ever went to, and the first science and skeptic uh, skepticism conference I ever went to was in Buffalo um, as well. And then I ended up going to a SUNY too. Um, sure, Paul Kurtz did lots of great work with the Center for Inquiry there and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's um it's it's very interesting to see how how small the world is when it comes to that. And I think you're absolutely right too about um about uh, this perception of of I, I understand your perception of the new atheists, for instance, when it comes to um, uh, at least how they brand themselves to a degree every once in a while. Um, I understand the criticism even from our religious opponents when they say that sometimes the works of the new atheists can come off as too childish in comparison to you know the philosophies of old. Um, you know, yeah, I, we well, have, I mean, uh, oftentimes, I mean, Dawkins in particular, I mean, listen, the guy's done a lot of good and I admire him. I don't mean to be throwing him under the bus. Uh, but I mean, he, he is a, uh, an outstanding biologist and the selfish gene is, is an absolutely amazing work. Uh, but he's not a philosopher and he doesn't treat uh, philosophical arguments with the sophistication uh, that a number of theists do. And so, uh, while he may not have a straw man, he comes a little too close to it uh, in, in some cases for, for my taste. And, uh, you know, we, we always have to steal man rather than straw man our opponents and, and look at the best possible arguments that they may have. Yeah, and I'm a firebrand. I consider myself to be a bit strident, but simultaneously... Not all atheists are like myself. Not all atheists are like Richard Dawkins. You know, this is where we really do need to care about diversity. We're diverse at AFL. Um, <laughs> and um, if you read plenty of the books from modern day atheists, who do they cite? They cite atheists from the 17th century, from the 18th century, from the 19th century. Ideas that have existed that predated this modern day culture war back and forth television breakdown of religion. Um, it might be very entertaining to some, but for a lot of people that are very educated in philosophy, who actually want to have a genuine, maybe academic understanding of free thinking, free thought, skepticism, um, you really have to dive deeper um, than, uh, than a few people that you ended up seeing in some YouTube clips. Um, and so I think it was, it was very important. It was one of the first questions I wanted to really get, um, get into here because uh, it's, it's, it's one that, that needs to be had. Um, and I want to make sure that, you know, we uh, tap into a little bit more philosophy and a little bit more of the diversity of thought in atheism here at AFL. Yeah, no, that that's great. And uh, I mean, on a certain level, uh, the burden of proof is on the religious believer. That certainly is the case. And so uh, if you don't find uh, the, the, the arguments put forward or the evidence uh, at all compelling, as I don't, uh, you can leave it at that. Uh, but, but it just is unfortunately the case sometimes uh, that, you know, people will say like, oh, Thomas Aquinas was just silly or something like that. And that that's just not fair and, and, and a really educated view of it. If, if we want respect for our positions, we need to give respect to the other side and, and look for the best that they have to offer. Absolutely. Um, and speaking of looking to see what people have to author, uh, to offer, see, that's one they, we have to make a meme compilation video of like all the little, little tiny mistakes I've made. I usually make only one mistake for a stream. I hope that's the only one. Um, <laughs> but you have quite a bit to offer when it comes to the realm of ideas that you are pushing. One of the main things that you're known for is being an advocate for existentialism. And I know, um, we have, we have, atheists of various different philosophical interests. You know, I know you had a back and forth with uh, with Justin. He's a big advocate for stoicism. You're a big advocate for existentialism. But one of the big 
talking points I, I've heard you give is, is how it has to do with individual liberty and an advocacy for individual sovereignty and individual liberty as to how you go about your life and how you go about your existence. And a big chunk of our membership and a big chunk of our audience are advocates of liberty, advocates of wanting to live their lives in ways that no government nor God can tell them how to be. And I'd like to also give you the floor to maybe explain to everybody here, what is existentialism? Um, how does it differ from other older philosophies like Stoicism, for instance? And why should one consider taking up the mantle of calling themselves an existentialist? Yeah, great. So, I mean, there is some overlap with, uh, with Stoicism. I mean, and, and Justin and I have done some dialogue in, in teasing that out, but if, if I were to give a definition, sort of a quick one, it, it's existentialism is a philosophy that's reacting to an apparently absurd and meaningless world through acts of freedom and self-creation in order to become a genuine person. And so for our purposes, uh, in short terms, it's basically a philosophy of individualism that highlights the importance of freedom and responsibility. Uh, and, and so... To me, uh, it, it seems a, a natural ally with libertarianism, more generally speaking. Uh, but one of the, uh, the oddities, historically speaking, is that uh, probably the arch existentialist Jean-Paul Sartre was a Marxist. Uh, but he was not always a Marxist. And uh, at least in my reading, and psychoanalyzing and sociological diagnosing of his time and place and biography, uh, I, I see him as, as sort of give, have, as having given in to the cool kids uh, and having been bullied a bit. Uh, he, for his uh, existentialist philosophy, was labeled as a bourgeois individualist by the Marxists of the time and just, you know, berated and berated. And we're talking... Uh, post-World War II, where the bad guys are labeled as on the right, uh, the fascists and the Nazis, uh, although they themselves are not capitalists uh, and, you know, in many ways come closer to socialism uh, than to capitalism. Uh, and it, it's just a story that I think we've seen play out time and again, uh, where someone takes a strong stance for liberty uh, and individualism and freedom, uh, and uh, someone else in, in the cooler club uh, kind of makes them feel bad about it and berates them and shames them, and uh, they sort of come over to uh, this other side because it's, uh, it's more popular. It's, uh, existentialism values authenticity and genuineness, uh, perhaps uh, second only to freedom, and yet, to me, there's some real bad faith uh, or inauthenticity going on in, in Sartre uh, in his move to Marxism, particularly since he engaged in lots of double talk after the fact, trying to somehow harmonize uh, the uh, existentialist uh, sense of individual responsibility uh, with the uh, Marxist externalization of responsibility upon the system and upon the state, uh, it's a tough marriage to, to, to make, and it, it requires a lot of double talk, if you ask me. Yeah. This is literally the most perfect time for the best background noise ever. But I think that is a very good explanation, and uh, boy, I hope the audio editors can fix this. One of the issues that I see that's an issue in modern culture war is the there goes the dog, um, is the idea of grifting. There has been an understandable um, distaste for grifting. And it's something that I find to be quite annoying. You know, you have on the woke side of things, uh, back when I was in the atheist community, plenty of us pretending to be woke, pretending to have woke views, um, just to uh, just to not get canceled in the atheist community. You know, and then on the other side, unfortunately, and this is one thing I uh, I see on the right, there are plenty of atheists that are apologizing for religion, apologizing for positions that they don't actually hold themselves to get accepted into a particular clique. 
Um, and it's, uh, it's disheartening. And when I was researching you, when I was listening to your stream with Justin from several years ago on Stoic Solutions, you were talking about this urge to be genuine, this urge to live an authentic life, um, not even if you have the most amount of support to your name or to what you do. And I think that for a lot of people who care about liberty and the ability to live one's life without repercussions in that regard, authenticity should really be a big component in that. Well, uh, absolutely. And uh, movements and uh, streams of thought require firebrands, as you uh, describe yourself, and, and Dawkins. I, I tend to be more of the, the quiet uh, atheist variety. And, and so uh, although uh, I don't dissemble and pretend to be anything that I'm not, uh, I won't always correct somebody. Uh, I don't find it uh, necessary to go to every argument that I'm invited to or die on every hill and that kind of thing. And I've probably uh, even rubbed a little zombie guts on myself uh, once or twice. Uh, that, that, that's a reference to uh, the, the Walking Dead, where one way to keep the zombies away is to rub a little zombie guts on you. It's just not always uh, worth it. But uh, th there, there is a real problem when we, we just sort of uh, go along uh, completely. And I, I've, I've not been involved in uh, the organized uh, atheist movement uh, as you have, but I, but I see uh, the problems that have arisen there and the importance of, of not just going along uh, and certainly breaking away. And uh, the, the way in which uh, the, the wokeism seems to have uh, taken over uh, really doesn't surprise me in, in a way because Nietzsche's diagnosis of uh, uh, the death of God is that its, uh, its shadows would be cast uh, for centuries to come. Uh, and in particular, he was uh, concerned about so-called atheists that they really would not live uh, without God, without religion, that they would just find other things to deify or make religions into. Uh, and certainly you see that with all kinds of secular ideologies. Uh, John McWhorter in his uh, recent book, uh, Woke Racism, talks about wokeism as a religion. Uh, and he has a nice analysis of that and, and its template. And you can argue about whether that's uh, fitting or not, but, but it certainly seems to be filling a hole for people uh, that uh, shouldn't necessarily be there. And, and to me, that's one of the real values in existentialism uh, is that it, it urges us to self-define uh, and create our own meaning and uh, not to look for uh, a group or uh, some substitute for what may have been there originally in, in terms of religious belief. And that's a particular challenge for people like me, and it sounds like you, Thomas, uh, who start off coming from uh, a religious background. Uh, I mean, to me, losing uh, faith in God was a tremendous upheaval, just the way that Nietzsche said it would be. Uh, and, you know, I, I could have uh, fled into uh, whatever, uh, some sort of secular ideology, political, oftentimes it's politics, quite frankly. Uh, in fact, uh, well, you know, Karl Marx's famous quote that uh, religion is the opiate of the people. Uh, Raymond Aron, uh, who was a contemporary of Sartre's, uh, had a book called The Opium of the Intellectuals, uh, which was about the way in which Marxism uh, played the role of new religion uh, for atheists. And, you know, sure, you're still an atheist uh, if you don't believe in God, but you really haven't uh, come to grips with the challenge that's posed by it uh, if you have a substitute religion. Yeah. And we, not to toot the same horn every stream, we've seen that we saw this, yeah, easily happen within the so called community of atheists, so called community of free thinkers. And I think coming at this from another angle, too. When it came to new people looking at organized free thought, organized skepticism, they probably saw that movement as inauthentic because they saw everybody moving into this kind of dogmatic way of thinking where they adopted a new form of dogma um, blindfully in mass. 
to where various types of people trying to find a purpose um, just didn't want to get involved in the first place. It was a lack of authenticity. It was a lack of actual value. And it was so-called free thinkers embracing a new religion. Yeah, I mean, from the outside looking in, it certainly appears that way in some cases. I don't want to say that there are no uh, genuine uh, woke people. Uh, I certainly I certainly know some who are, are quite nice and friendly and, and uh, seem sincere, if misguided, in, in my opinion. Uh, but, but it is very fashionable uh, and uh, very much... Uh, coerced in, in in lots of circles. I mean, uh, I come from the academic realm where, you know, that that certainly is the case. Uh, I, I I teach at a Catholic college, uh, and I can be quite open uh, about my atheism because I'm not a jerk about it. And uh, you know, the the I've I've always had friends who were Catholic priests and things like that, and they they respect a good philosophical uh, discussion, at least most of them in my experience. And being an atheist is, is not a problem, uh, but being a libertarian, uh, <laughs> that, that, that's more problematic. Uh, even at a Catholic, even at a Catholic college. Yeah. I mean, because, uh, at, you know, we, we, at Catholic colleges just aren't what they were. I had gone to, to Fordham as an undergrad. And when I went to Fordham, I think probably 90% of the student body was Catholic, and uh, it was certainly an important hiring criterion for uh, faculty as well. And although my college uh, has an important uh, dedication to its Catholic mission, there are just fewer and fewer clergy and fewer and fewer uh, faculty who are uh, you know, devoted uh, to the Catholic mission. And I mean, there there are plenty of uh, died in the wool Catholics who are also uh, wokists. Uh, I mean, the, the, you know, and some of those are are the most troubling <laughs> from, from my perspective. Yeah, i I find it, I find things to be extremely odd now. You know, you wouldn't have think that 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 the lines would have been like this ten years ago, unless you did experience the same thing. Like I don't know, back in twenty twelve or whatever. But like. I saw in the comments of our recent clip that we uploaded of, uh, of who is it? Um, of James Lindsay from, from one of our previous streams, there was the most popular comments got like 30 likes so far is about how he has more support being an atheist from conservative Christians than support he has being conservative or libertarian or, or not woke from woke people from woke atheists even. And I'm I'm not surprised when you said that you are treated fairly respectfully as an atheist at a Catholic institution. Not to you know toot any horn for Catholicism. I'm not a fan of Catholicism in any way, but um, I think it's it's very interesting to point out uh, where where things have gone. You have some of the most free thinking and anti organized religion based atheists speaking at universities and at colleges that you think would have never accepted them. And meanwhile, the colleges and universities they used to teach at don't want them back at, in any way whatsoever. Um, Peter Bogosian, for instance, yeah. uh, and plenty of other people. Um, so do you think it's it, that's a good thing? Like it's a breath of fresh air that maybe you're able to communicate and tell others on campus about atheism and, and, and your, your positions without without any uh, ridicule? Do you think you've been able to kind of normalize atheism in that space? Well, I mean, I, I think it's, it, it's always, it's always been that way in my, my experience. I mean, I was a little more guarded uh, early on in my, my career about uh, my, my non-belief, uh, that kind of thing. You know, I, I needed to be, uh, but I, I think there, there's, I mean, like I say, my experience, uh, and I was educated by Jesuits, and I found the Jesuits to be really very free-thinking and open-minded. I don't know. I mean, in the college that I'm at now, are Fathers of the Holy Cross, who are the, the folks at Notre Dame, they, they've been very free-thinking and very accepting as well. It's just never been a problem for me. I think a bigger problem for me at a Catholic college would be as if I were a Catholic philosopher 
who started espousing things that were against Catholic doctrine, you know, right. on abortion or something like that. Uh, but I, I think uh, they find you to be a contradiction. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I'm I'm breaking party line at that point if I'm a Catholic yeah. and and going against uh, and and going pro life. But if if I'm an atheist, I mean that that adds variety to the mix. Although, although uh, there are you know a large number of atheists on on the faculty of of my college, I'm I'm quite sure it's just not always advertised. Uh, what is advertised is is one's woke. <laughs> credentials you have to unfortunately out. Yeah, yeah i bet even still at a catholic institution you know oh I, yeah um, and i try to tell people too just because one is at a religious institution uh doesn't mean that it's that it's free from wokeness that religion is somehow the solution to wokeism i gave a talk uh at um a, a state university nearly a year ago about how um i've been chatting with uh some some friendly politicians that I get along with. And this was during the 2021 election um, in my area. And you had a lot of so-called, um, uh, you know, conservatives and even Republican uh, politicians asking, why the heck am I going into, I'm going into these very religious neighborhoods. I'm trying to campaign, you know, on, on lawns that have the Virgin Mary on it. And they're not voting for me. They're not voting. They're not voting for, for my stuff. But but are they're religious. They're Catholic. Why aren't they voting for me? Because just because one's religious doesn't mean that they're automatically going to vote for you. Religion isn't some magical, you know, checkbox that automatically um, means that they're going to side with you. Everybody makes up their own religion day by day. Um, one Catholic believes one thing, another Catholic believes another thing. And it, uh, it was a perfect toot to my horn, uh, because I was able to tell people, look, you know, there are going to be religious people that vehemently disagree with you. And once I started explaining that as an atheist, people really started to get it. Yeah, no, that's right. And, and I mean, at least my psychoanalyzing of, of some people who I see is, uh, in academia, uh, religion is is largely under attack and not looked on with, with the greatest of uh, of respect. And so, if, if one is a, a serious religious believer, particularly at a Catholic institution, they seem all the more uh, inclined to try to demonstrate their intellectual credibility by being uh, politically far left. At least that's the way it appears to me. With, with some people because right. being politically far left has a lot of intellectual and academic credence. So going into authenticity, going into plenty of things that we've said kind of in, in little moments here already in this stream, um, there is a concern. And if you talk to anybody on uh, in the senior staff of AFL or in the board of directors, they'll know that this is one of my biggest problems that I see with some of our allies even. I have seen, uh, while I very much appreciate working with religious allies in the fight against, say, wokeism, I am not a fan of seeing some free-thinking atheists, plenty of whom who I know deep down are still very um, opposed to organized religion or very opposed to faith. That that is just not a lot, you know, uh, not a component of their lives whatsoever. Kowtow and start to become apologists for organized faith and become apologists for religion in this new vibe of we need meaning in life. We need purpose in life. Humans, we're animals. We need stories, Thomas. Therefore, religion is necessary. All this atheism stuff, oh, that was a mistake. What solution do you have to, you know, that, that what solution do you have, Thomas, um, to show me that can make me live an authentic, good, meaningful life without religion. Because we've gone too far. We need to bring religion back because this crazy woke thing is happening. This crazy woke thing is happening. So I'm going to abandon my atheism or I'm going to claim that I'm a you know Christian atheist or a Protestant atheist or whatever. Um, instead of actually providing authentic secular solutions as to one could maybe live one's life. And... This is a major topic that I know you cover in your line of work. Um, and I'd like to also give you um, the platform to talk about how within existentialism, 
there is a solution, at least a solution that you purport to be the case. Yeah, no, that, that's right. And I guess one thing I'd like to, to clarify is uh, in, in terms of teaching, I don't really teach atheism. I try not to teach anyone what to think. I try to mm -hmm. teach them how to think. And uh, I think I've done my job uh, well when students are confused about what I think. Uh, I talk mm -hmm. about you know, passing the ideological Turing test, right? Uh, so if listeners will know the Turing test is supposed to be uh, a test for whether a, a computer is intelligent, if it can uh, mimic a, a human being and fool uh, a third party into thinking it's a human being. Uh, I, 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 you know, like to think uh, by the end of the semester, students have no idea whether I'm a religious believer, or where I lie politically or any of that. Uh, but that differentiates me pretty radically from uh, most of my colleagues, unfortunately, who use the classroom uh, for advocacy. At least a lot of them do. Uh, but so back to your, your question about uh, uh, whether or not there's, uh, you know, atheists have gone too far and there's real value in religion that we should go back to, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I, I certainly understand uh, the difficulty uh, of struggling uh, to make sense of and give meaning to a human life. Uh, and so, you know, with, with reference to Marx again, not only did he call religion the, uh, the opium uh, of the masses, but he also said it's the heart of a heartless world. Uh, and there's some real truth to that. I mean, I don't agree with Marx on much of anything, uh, but I agree with him uh, on that, that it has provided comfort uh, for people throughout time. Uh, and life is difficult and painful. And uh, this is something uh, that the Stoics recognize. It's something the existentialists recognize. And uh, well, I mean, it, it's possible for someone to retreat back into religion of, of a certain kind, I suppose, but, but I certainly don't advocate it. And I wouldn't find it genuine or authentic for myself. Uh, and this yeah. is why I, I urge people to uh, familiarize themselves with the existentialist philosophers, particularly Nietzsche and Sartre, uh, because although there's a kind of a gloom to them in a way, uh, Sartre uh, characterizes his philosophy as optimistic toughness. Uh, right. and, and that's what I'm really calling for myself as well, that Listen, life may be without a pre-given, God-given meaning. Uh, we may not be able to look to uh, Ten Commandments etched in stone, uh, but life is nonetheless uh, worth living uh, and in some ways even more exciting uh, in that way. Uh, but you have to uh, be willing to uh, you know, go out on the, uh, the stormy seas a bit. I mean, it, it's an experience that we all have in smaller ways all the time in life, whether it's going to live away from home for the first time or first day at a new job where it's scary, it's difficult. Uh, but in, instead of just pretending uh, that it's all going to be all right and that there is a, a God looking out for us and everything happens for a reason, uh, it's much more empowering uh, to say, all right, I, I'm the author uh, of my own life. I'm going to give it its meaning. I'm going to give it its purpose. Uh, that, that's really much more ennobling. Yeah. And if we are the so-called free thinkers, we are the so-called skeptics, we're the so-called naturalists who live in the real world, who criticize, you know, woke people, for instance, for living in a safe space, for not embracing facts and the reality of life, we have to treat religion the same way. Um, we have to treat religious faith the same way. And we have solutions. There are plenty of thinkers like yourself in today's world that for a career, explain this to the general public, exp explains, you know, explain this to students, to people that are trying to broaden their minds. Maybe, maybe it's that we don't make it sexy enough. Maybe we have to find a way to, to try to... Um, uh, to try to make uh, these talking points edgier. Maybe we just got to have you on the channel a little more. <laughs> but um, it's it's a frustration that I that I hold quite vehemently. And I am very, very glad that you said that. Um, and it needs to be said more. It really does. Well, uh, I'm glad to hear we're on the same page. So 
We've been getting quite a good amount of comments, quite a good amount of questions in the live chat already. People are saying, I love this discussion. I'm so glad I came in. I'm reading this on the side here. So I'm very glad that uh, that everything is, is going to be very entertaining. And already just knowing the algorithm, this is probably going to get at least a few hundred views to a thousand views for an early channel. That's big, everybody. Okay? <laughs> All right, um, so I'm, I'm very, very glad because I, this has already been such an amazing discussion. And I want to get into more of this with the Q&A because sometimes the questions that I come up with are, are sometimes way, 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 way more boring compared to some of the amazing stuff that our amazing membership and audience has for all of us. So we got my friend Ruin of the Gods, an amazing YouTuber, guys. Go subscribe to him as well. He's got a question for you, sir. What is your general impression of Catholic philosophy? In particular, what do you think of Thomas Aquinas and the rest of the scholastics? Well, I, I'm, I'm not a, a fan, uh, let's put it that way, and there was way too much of it in, in my uh, college education, uh, but I think we need to give credit where credit is due for these people in their time and place. I mean, uh, Aquinas really was uh, incredibly learned, uh, read very, very widely across not just the, uh, the ancient Greeks. Uh, and the Islamic world, but he, he read everything he could get his hands on and tried his best to present the opposing uh, side uh, on, on every issue as fairly as he could. And listen, you know, he's living at a, at a time before the understanding of the, of the theory of evolution, before modern biblical criticism. Uh, but, you know, he, he's, he's, uh, he took lots of intellectual chances uh, in the sense of uh, reviving the study of Aristotle uh, in Western Europe, which uh, led to his condemnation. Uh, so uh, I, I don't find a lot of value uh, in, in his arguments, uh, but uh, you know, I, I certainly respect him uh, as a historical thinker and, and uh, a person of his time and place. And similar things can be said of, uh, of many of the other uh, scholastic philosophers. I mean, as I said early on, uh, Catholic philosophy has this tradition of faith-seeking understanding, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, Martin Luther and the, the Protestant Reformation called reason a whore. Uh, so th there's been a strain of Protestantism, uh, which has been anti-intellectual and anti-question because you can reason your way to anything, right? Supposedly, never minding the fact that you could have faith in, in just about anything. Uh, so, I mean, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not a, a Catholic atheist, I suppose, in the sense that I'm going to Catholic uh, church on Sunday, the way I know plenty of uh, Jewish atheists who, who go to synagogue. But I'm culturally Catholic. Uh, I, I can't uh, say that's not part of my uh, upbringing and baggage, good and bad. And uh, so with some of that comes maybe a soft spot for uh, the, uh, the, the scholastics, including Aquinas. And, and certainly I teach them uh, with enthusiasm and you know gust, uh, gusto and zest and zeal and whatever else in the classroom to give them their, their best presentation. And I think you're authentic. <laughs> when it comes to holding that view, my, the right. problem that I stated earlier about some people, you know, kowtowing too much of religion is, I, is that I feel like with some, they don't actually hold that belief. They just purport it for YouTube or they purport it for the, the political circle that they're in or the conference that they're, you know, giving a talk at. And I think that is just, it's, it's not healthy and it's not good. If you actually have respect for religious individuals who have done a great service to humanity, maybe even so in the name of their faith. Yeah. Um, I think that is something that we should truthfully acknowledge. If there are atheists that are like, oh, you know, none of none of these religious thinkers have done anything good for humanity whatsoever, nothing good for Western civilization, nothing good for the progression of the Enlightenment, they're liars. They'd yeah. be lying. Yeah. You know, and I could I could speak on I think I can speak on behalf of of most of them given given uh given my title and my position. But um I I think that if we came across those discussions in a more authentic way where yeah, there are some atheists that want to identify as Catholic atheists or, or, or you know, secular Catholics or secular Christians, the way that, you know, we, we treat um, Jewish atheism and secular Judaism. Um, I think I think we'd be having a more broader 
and more healthy community instead of people that are just grifting and not being their authentic selves, advocating for individual liberty. Right. Um, so appreciate the comment, Ruin of the Gods. Again, everybody check out his channel. Uh, we got Jonathan Barbie here. He's got a great question. In what ways can the environment of where you work at be maintained and continue to spread healthy academic settings? I'm, I'm not 100% sure I, I understand the question. Uh, asking how my particular college can be, what, what, how do you interpret that question? Um, I'm going to guess myself. Uh, and Jonathan Barbie, if you want to answer in the live chat, uh, feel free and we can put up the clarification. I'm assuming that he's talking about, uh, yeah, your institution, King's College. Um, where, you know, in what ways can the environment of King's College be maintained um, currently if it's in any good positive state and you don't want yeah. to go, you know, get worse culturally um, right. to continue to spread healthy academic settings? I think that's what he's asking. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I mean, the, the headlines uh, about academia are, are always bad because that bad news sells and gets attention and clicks and, and all of that. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure uh, that, uh, I'm not sure that there is uh, just a, an overwhelming infection uh, of of wokeism. At, you know, I don't know. I mean, I only teach one college, so what what, what can I say? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, it, for example, at my college, it it isn't the students at all uh, who are the uh, uh, the instigators or the agitators or anything like that. It, it's it's the faculty. Uh, and, you know, uh, you know, all it takes is, is a small group of agitators or advocates or activists to get a lot of attention. And I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I guess, uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm all about having respectful dialogue. Uh, and, and so treating those that you disagree with, with respect and uh and communicating that uh that uh that goes a long way I, I think and and i haven't always done that particularly well i was more the firebrand when i was younger i was more the provocateur and that that kind of thing uh but you know that 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 got old i suppose uh so i i don't i don't know i just i, I think there's there's so much to be said for uh, treating someone with respect, even when they're not treating you with respect and trying to get them to, uh, come up to your level. So maybe that addresses the question. Hopefully. Thank you, Jonathan, for asking. Appreciate it. All right. Oh, look who we have here. Look who we have here. Of course. <laughs> of course we got Justin. Um, no, but I, I, I did tell, I did ask Justin if, uh, if he wanted to tune in, cause I know he is a, obviously a big fan of yours without Justin, this conversation wouldn't even be happening. So uh, very happy that we are platforming his question. Hello, Justin. So he has a question for you, Dr. Irwin. Can you talk about the Seinfeld AIDS ribbon episode and how it endures today? Oh my God. All right. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm the, uh, the editor of a book called Seinfeld in philosophy and Justin and I share a lot in common, including being Seinfeld fans, I, uh, I suppose. Uh, and, uh, yeah, he drew my attention to, to that episode, which has come up in, uh, in, in recent debates. Uh, it, it's a small part of, uh, of an episode I think called the sponge, which is, uh, more noteworthy for its main plot line, uh, of, uh, Elaine, uh, running out of her chosen form of contraception, the sponge. But anyway, uh, Kramer, uh, the lovable goofball from the show, uh, goes to an AIDS walk uh, to support uh, financially, uh, in terms of attention, etc., the uh, the cause of AIDS, and uh, they uh, give him a ribbon to wear, and uh, he says, "No, nah, no thanks, no ribbon." And oh, well, you gotta wear the ribbon, right? He just walks away, and then somebody wears your ribbon, you gotta wear the ribbon, blah blah blah. 
He ends up getting beaten up in an alley. Uh, there he is supporting uh, the cause, right? Uh, but just because he won't go this uh, extra step of putting on a ribbon, he, he's abused. And uh, Justin drew that to my attention as, as in some ways really mirroring the, uh, the you know, the, the culture wars uh, as they are now, right? So for example, you can think of uh, of trans rights. I certainly uh, endorse trans rights. There should be no discrimination, no ill treatment, et cetera, et cetera. But you know what one of the uh, the woke virtue signaling things that you see very commonly in academia and other areas these days is people including their pronouns and their uh, email signatures. Uh, I mean, that's fine if you want to do that and show solidarity, although I'm a little suspicious. Uh, at least in some cases, what that's about. But if if you're telling me I've got to do that, that that's kind of like telling Kramer he's got to uh, put on the uh, the uh, the AIDS ribbon, you know. And uh, I, I mean, I, I try not to mock uh, because it doesn't, you know, make friends on the other side. But I, I have a little fun with with uh, someone wants to know my pronouns. I think oh, I tell you my adjectives. Yeah. Uh, they're godless, free, and happy. How's that? <laughs> you know? I think I'd agree to that. You're here. Um, but it's, it's so interesting that all this is happening at the same time. And, two, think, and think about with Seinhold. Uh, Seinhold. Mistake <laughs> number two, everybody. Seinfeld. You know, that was 90 satire. Yeah. You know, we thought of it, or rightfully so, as a joke. Now, as of seven days ago today, at all 64, I'm, I'm, I live in New York currently, at all 64 SUNY campuses, the SUNY Board of Trustees uh, voted, I believe unanimously, I could be wrong, but I think it was unanimously, to force, um, uh, to, ba to basically instill a policy where um, a student's pronouns has to be respected, where, where you as a professor, you as an academic person must um, by force, uh, address somebody by their preferred pronouns at all 64 campuses, including like community colleges in upstate New York. Um, you know, and SUNY is one of the largest public, um, educational institutions in the United States. And this is happening there. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's either already a policy or a policy incoming for the UC system and the UM system in Wisconsin, um, or UW system in Wisconsin. Um, it's, it's, rather unfortunate. And I hold a very similar liberty-minded view. I want everybody to be treated with dignity and respect as individuals, regardless of, of their orientation or what they call themselves or whatever. I'm not going to bully you. I'm not going to treat you differently just because of how, how you may identify or how you know you see the world, even if I might think that your worldview could even be delusional. Um, I always try to be a nice, caring, humanistic person. I don't want a gun to my head, though, telling me that I need to call you by a certain pronoun. This is one of the things I know no, made that's right. Jordan yeah. Peterson very famous a few years ago. And now this is happening in the United States, you know, not Canada or the UK or Australia that don't really have a constitution, don't really have a First Amendment. It's now happening here more and more and more when not everybody can go to Harvard or Yale or spend a ridiculous amount of of money to go somewhere they might want to go to a public institution and now there's just this awful um awful religion you could say that yeah, I mean, uh I, 20 I, years I ago we would have seen in seinfeld i i, I don't mind calling that anybody but whatever pronouns that they want and, and sure. listen, if, if i did uh, I, I would just find a way to call them by their first name or their preferred first name. I mean, to me, it's, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, I think it was a bigger deal in Canada with Jordan Peterson because, I mean, they don't have the same uh, liberty that we do and the force of law behind it, et cetera. I mean, it, it is potentially a, a threat to uh, not the, uh, the, the uh, well, I mean, it's a state institution. That really does get sort of tricky, right? Uh, mm -hmm. It'd be a different thing if, if uh, on a private college campus they right. were mandating this. But in a, in, a, in a state institution, it gets tricky. And, uh, you know, uh, w what the, it, could somebody be fired over that, lose tenure? I, I don't know. I mean, th there would really have to be a court uh, case in, in, in that situation. And I, I hope 
uh, the side of liberty would prevail. But this goes back to just what I was saying before of, uh, you know, not, not every hill is worth dying on. And even if, and this is not what I think, but even if I did think, you know, your pronouns are silly, uh, you know, I'd still call you by whatever you wanted. And, you know, if I had, a, if I had some real ideological problem, I'd just find a way to call you by your first name. I mean, it can be avoided. And they have every right to express themselves the way they want to express themselves. You know, that is free speech. Sure. Um, you know, they, you know, they are in an academic environment, you know, the, the, this, this kind of bastion in the, at least in the West of a free thought and expression and disagreement and debate. I'm in favor of that. I'm in favor of woke people having their right to identify and express themselves the way they want to. But just like, when it comes to Christians and Muslims and Jews and, uh, you know, religious advocates, just don't make it the law of the land. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'll tell you what, I, I don't appreciate the aggressive tone of a, of a lot of it too. I think so much comes down to, to tone. Uh, and that there's also the sort of presumption of agreement. I mean, th this is the problem that I find for me, particularly politically as a, as a libertarian uh, on college campuses and with a lot of academic colleagues that uh, they just automatically uh, assume that I agree with their economic views and political views. And, you know, because you're either either evil or stupid if you don't, and probably both. Uh, that, that, that's what really gets me because I, I don't take that line of view with somebody who's a religious believer or somebody who's a far left socialist. I don't necessarily presume that they're evil or stupid or delusional. Hey, Jennifer. We got a great question here, Doctor Irwin. What's the best rook? Ugh, the be there we go. Mistake number three. What is the best book? This is how you know I haven't gotten much sleep. What's the <laughs> book you read so far this year? That's, yeah, that that is a great question. So, trying to think of uh, of something very recent, as in this year, uh, I mentioned before uh, John McWhorter's uh, book "Woke uh, Woke yes, Racism," yeah. right? And uh, McWhorter, by the way, is an atheist, and he's certainly for liberty and against wokeism. So, I'd, I'd encourage you to try to get in touch with him. Uh, he'd be a real coup to have on uh, on on the show or to have some connection with. Uh, Absolutely. But that, that's a terrific book. Uh, so I'd, I'd certainly recommend that. Finbard60 asks, do you think that the rise of Protestantism and its literalist approach to the Bible was ultimately a cause for the decline of Christianity in later centuries? <laughs> Uh, I mean, that, that's a great question. I'm, I'm not really a historian or sociologist of, of religion, so I can only speculate in uh, armchair terms, but certainly a, a literalist uh, interpretation uh, of the Bible just doesn't hold up uh, in the modern world. The earth isn't 6,000 years old. Creation didn't take place uh, the way it did uh, in the, uh, the scripture. There are all kinds of contradictions and problems. Uh, so certainly that doesn't help. Uh, so, and, 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 and certainly it's got to have led to the, uh, to the decline in some ways. But I, I also need to give credit uh, to the, uh, the Protestant scholars uh, because although I've been touting uh, the open-mindedness of, uh, of Jesuit priests and, and some of my Catholic friends, uh, really biblical criticism begins in Germany with, uh, with Protestant scholars. Uh, they're really the ones uh, who do the, uh, the initial groundwork, and, and in some ways they're still uh, far ahead of, uh, of Catholic scholars there. So, I mean, Protestantism is, is just so diverse, uh, and you have everything from you know, the Westboro Baptist Church to the Unitarian Church and, you know, there's such variety. Uh, but, uh, I, I mean, I, I suppose the uh, more stringent uh, a religious view is uh, and the more literal it is, the easier it may ultimately be to reject on intellectual grounds. And so, yeah, to get back to the, uh, the question, it, it certainly probably led to the, uh, the decline. T.J. Tuttle asks, 
Do you think the dichotomy at play in the culture war can be boiled down to the adversarial relationship between justice-based morality and care-based morality? Wow. Uh, I mean, that, that that's an interesting question. I, I think of care-based morality as being very much uh, associated with feminist care ethics. And uh, certainly you see some of that on the left, uh, but also uh, a justice-based approach to morality. At least the name has been co-opted in, in terms of social justice. I, I tend to just think of justice. Uh, once you put an adjective in front of it, you're modifying it in a way that, uh, that limits the actual justice. So the, uh, the, 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 the person asking the question uh, may well be thinking of uh, the sort of debate between, uh, well, uh, Carol Gilligan and care-based ethics br breaking away from Kohlberg and, and Piaget, who had a very uh, masculine, so-called uh, justice-based ethics. And, you know, so, some of that may be there. And uh, the, uh, the care-based ethics is certainly looser and uh, certainly has been uh, expanded and, and diluted uh, by many thinkers such that we get some of the odd uh, views that are that are taken by you know very radical fem feminists and, and leftists uh, that don't seem to uh, have much regard for evidence and seem to think that uh, one needs to be of a certain gender or ethnicity or sexual orientation to understand and critique. Uh, so it, it seems to be a play in, in that sense. Of the God mm -hmm. says the Protestants were bad in so far as they returned to the roots of the early church fathers. Well, yeah. I, I, I can agree with, with that, particularly uh, with regard to Calvinism. Uh, I think uh, Calvinism in particular goes back to Augustine, and uh, there, there's a lot uh, in Augustine where there, there's sort of uh, double talk uh, about. Uh, human free will and divine foreknowledge, where uh, Augustine thinks that uh, God exists outside of time. Uh, and so uh, his knowledge of what we will do in the future is not really the future to him. And so free will is compatible with divine foreknowledge. And I think there's a lot drawn on in Augustine and some of the early church fathers in, in Calvinism and predestination uh, in particular, and also just a terrible sense of sinfulness. I mean, uh, Augustine is probably my least favorite of the uh, scholastics and early Catholic philosophers, just because more than anyone else, uh, he uh, uh, is responsible for the popularization of the, uh, the notion of original sin uh, and, and just the tremendous guilt uh, that we uh, associate with, uh, with bodily and earthly existence. And it, it reminds me, you know, sometimes you, you play the, uh, the game of uh, if you could travel back in time and kill one person, right? I mean, that, that, of course, has its own paradox problems. But for the sake of entertaining it, right, and everybody says Hitler, and yeah, I guess, right? Uh, how could you not? But Augustine would be way up on my list of, uh, of assassination uh, targets just because of what he did in terms of uh, uh, guilt and, uh, and original sin. And these types of paradoxes, these are God's greatest gifts to atheist activists and to those debunking religious faith. The argument I've used ever since I got started uh, as an atheist in high school was the argument of if you are an evangelical Protestant or a very fervent Roman Catholic with the belief that your God transcends time, knows when you're going to sin, knows what you're going to do anyways, um, and has the ability, because this God's also all powerful, to prevent you from committing those sins. That's a pretty crummy God, if you ask me, because that God is intentionally setting you up for failure. That God is intentionally setting you up for a lake of fire um, when you die. That's that's not a benevolent, all loving, all forgiving being that loves you even when you're burning in a lake. Um, if so, then uh, that God's got a very, very uh, 
fetishistic for yeah. lack of an yeah. actual word way of uh well, I mean, that, that's the classic problem of evil, right? Of how do we reconcile evil in the world with uh, an all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful God? And, uh, you know, there, there are sophisticated arguments to, to make uh, about uh, the, the place of free will and the possibility of redemption. And some sort of enlightened Christians will even say that hell isn't uh, forever and, and that kind of thing. But it's the natural evil, so-called uh, COVID, AIDS, talk about the AIDS ribbon, COVID, AIDS, earthquakes, childhood cancer, all of that. I mean, what's that doing in the world uh, if God is all loving and all powerful, right? Now, of course, there are responses to that that uh, that learned, uh, uh, you know, theists will have. I mean, I'm giving it short shrift, but it is a it is a daunting problem uh, for the uh, for the believer. Daryl says that he thinks there are many closet atheists in every religion, and that's why atheists can go to these religious institutions and speak and be received in a friendly manner. Yeah. You know, unless you're wearing an atheist T-shirt or uh, claim directly that you're part of an atheist organization or that you're a content creator, um, you can blend in quite well. And a lot of people do. And I think a people should blend in a lot less and be truthful to who they are. But um, atheists have also been doing that since the dawn of time. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I, I can't remember who it, who it was Uh uh, I want to say Seneca, but Justin will correct me if I'm wrong uh, about it. Uh, there's the uh, the line, uh, he lived well who hid well uh, about, I mean, you know, you, you, you can't uh, always put yourself out there. And, and it's been uh, important for atheists. Uh, I mean, we, we can be out of the closet uh, these days, right? Uh, you'll still have a a difficult time getting elected to political office and, and lots of other things, but we can be out of the closet. Whereas uh, in ages past, you know, yet you, you had to to blend in and uh, and that sort of thing. But but it is also true uh, the way in which uh, gay people have come out of the closet and uh, have let their identity be uh, be known, and that, that's a way of helping others, right? Uh, to give them the uh, sense of uh, not being alone. Uh, it's for the better when someone can uh, admit that they are uh, an atheist and, and not, not you don't have to advertise it or wear the t-shirt like you said, but uh, to be honest about it, and, and sure it's true, lots of religions uh, certainly do have uh, in the choir singing because it's fun to sing and be part of a group. Uh, sometimes in the pulpit or the synagogue, well, sometimes in the pulpit or, <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, there are plenty of, uh, of priests and ministers out there who've lost their faith and don't know quite what to do. Uh, lots of them eventually leave, but not all of them. So, I mean, it, it, it is kind of funny when you think of it that way. And I got to say, sometimes community really does help. You know, that's why Atheist for Liberty, at Atheist for Liberty, we've been growing every single month. Um, we have our Impossible Conversations workshops, our Sunday night discussion events, our conference exhibitions, the attendance even at these streams. It just keeps going up and up more and more because at, we at AFL are providing more options for atheists to be with like minds and to feel comfortable with one another. Um, so much so that we're continuing our events in person. And this is going to be the largest gathering so far of AFL members and volunteers. We're going to be at Freedom Fest 2022, July 13th to the 16th in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's basically the largest gather uh, gathering of libertarians and liberty-minded um, people in the nation. It's a massive event that takes place every summer in Vegas. They had it in South Dakota around a year ago, low due to COVID policies, but we were there. And we're going to be a gold sponsor this year. And already the demand for people to want to be with us just because they've formed community in our Discord chats with our online events. It's just absolutely amazing. And the resources that are that are now available for people to be who they are, it's remarkable. And it makes myself and all the other volunteers at AFL very grateful that we're doing the work that we do today. Yeah, no, that, that it's it's a great thing to be part of something that, that has a purpose that's larger than your own purpose, right? I mean, that, that's, I, I, 
I think of transcendence not in some sort of metaphysical, airy fairy kind of way, but belonging to something that that's larger than yourself and that has a mission larger than your own uh, oh. personal mission. And but that's Dr. Irwin, what you're doing. yeah. I'm not religious, so I <laughs> I can't have any meaning. I'm just some animal, uh, so I'm gonna have to just quiet down from here and not provide anything that actually could be a real value. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, religion has done a, a good job of supplying that uh, for people through the ages, right? You have a sense of community, culture, identity. Uh, and listen, I, I, I'm, a, I'm an introvert. I'm a bit of a loner. Uh, but even not, I need to belong uh, to some, you know, I belong to my family and I belong to uh, some some groups and uh, you know even I need to be with people, but I mean it, it's Absolutely. a funny it's a funny combination, right? I mean not funny. It makes perfect sense to me that uh, libertarian uh, atheist, but the, both groups tend to be real individualists, and it tends to be like herding cats trying to get together either group, and to get them both together is uh, is is really important. But I'll just mention in passing. I know the name is uh, is anathema to a lot of people, but uh, you know, in the uh, the, the libertarian and, and liberty movement, uh, Ayn Rand was an atheist, uh, although she's beloved by lots of conservatives and and religious folks. Uh, and you know, her atheism was just sort of uh, matter of fact. I'm I'm not a great fan of her uh philosophy i enjoyed atlas shrugged and fountainhead and and that kind of thing but she wasn't uh, a very sophisticated philosopher uh but you know nonetheless uh, there, there's there's lots of connection to be made uh between the individualism and the sense of freedom and responsibility that atheists endorse uh and uh economic liberty i mean i believe in uh in liberty and freedom in, in all its forms and uh, some people want to limit freedom in the set in the uh, the name of uh, somehow preserving freedom, uh, and I think that's best left for for children. Uh, you know, uh, adults I think should be able to do what they want, uh, including what they want economically and with their own private property. And so that's part of the uh, the message in uh, in the book that you're kind enough to mention uh, earlier on, the free market existentialist. Yes. Uh, whereas uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and, and most of the French existentialists were oddly, I think, uh, Marxists. I, I make the case in the book uh, that there's a really nice synergy to be found between uh, free market thinking uh, and existentialism with this emphasis on individualism, uh, freedom and responsibility. And, and that, in fact, the... Uh, uh, sense of giving oneself one's own meaning and taking responsibility for one's own life that's inherent in existentialism uh, even deals with some of the uh, issues uh, that people find in the, uh, uh, in the free market and in capitalist society. Consumerism uh, gets pointed to as, uh, as a sort of an ugly facet uh, of capitalist society where people are just buying uh, it's kind of, you know, consumerism in, in its raw form is really a kind of an addiction where people are buying goods and services to derive their self-worth and to signal their worth to other people. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that existentialist philosophy uh, helps you and counsels you to avoid, right? To be self-determined and self-choosing and be your own person. This is literally my metaphorical checklist going off, being extremely thankful that you mentioned that too. Too often, there are religious apologists who tell us, oh, if you're an atheist, you just care about materialism. You just care about physical items. You have no empathy. You have no morality. You have no feelings towards any other people um, and their struggles. You just care about what's best for you and only you. That's not true. I think capitalism is the greatest, personally speaking, I think capitalism is the greatest economic system that we that we have. But simultaneously, let's not be blind to the faults that we as humans who are animals make. And consumerism, overt, over consumerism is one of them. Yeah, uh, it, uh, abs absolutely. Right. And I mean, of course, it, it's silly to, to think and, and to take uh, the criticism that 
uh, atheism, uh, you know, uh, is necessarily going to lead to a, a lack of morality or values or caring for other people. It uh, instead puts that back, the, the onus and the burden back on, on the individual rather than simply uh, caring and, and acting in a certain way. Uh, well, frankly, when, when I was uh, a religious believer growing up, I was scared to death of hell. <laughs> you know, the nuns and the parish priests had put that uh, fear right into me. And, you know, even more than wanting to go to heaven, I was afraid of hell. And that was the motivation. Yeah. Uh, n now I've got to give myself my own motivation. And, uh, it, you know, th that's quite possible. Fanny Anzai asks, or at least states, that such secular nat uh, natural humans, uh, human values, can be generated with functional brains and basic human experiences. Yeah. Yeah, right. So, I mean, I, I think we come in in endowed with a certain sort of uh, core morality that uh, has evolved, right? I mean, uh, reciprocal altruism, a sense of fellow feeling, a sense of uh, guilt, a sense of uh, repaying right with right, repaying wrong with wrong. Uh, all of this was important for us evolving as, as social creatures. Uh, if, if we were complete uh, monsters, uh, you know, we wouldn't have been able to cooperate in the way that allowed the species to, uh, to thrive. Uh, now, every generation will have about 1% of the population who are psychopaths. Uh, who are missing whatever gene or uh, whatever it is, I'm not a biologist uh, or psychologist, uh, that uh, makes them without any empathy, without an ability to feel other people's feelings. And every generation is going to have, uh, you know, it, it's uh, complete saints uh, who are just maybe overly concerned in some cases uh, with the, the welfare uh, of others. But most of us you know, just the way that most of us are between, uh, you know, five feet and six feet tall. Some of us are a little taller. Some of us are a little shorter. But most of us are in there. Most of us are going to have the same basic responses that have evolved in terms of uh, reciprocity, guilt, uh, and all of that. I was about to, uh, to make a, a funny comment, but Jennifer beat me to it. I'm not a biologist will never not be a hilarious phrase. And I, I bet you will be able to, to make a very nice meme out of that. <laughs> William Irwin, awesome moments compilation. Um, I'm not a biologist either. I will go for the record. I am not a biologist and I'm also not a theologian. Yet religion is still a sham and a silly. Um, just like how I, uh, I'm not a biologist, but also know the basics of biology. <laughs> well, right. And, and I think that's an important part of, uh, of education uh, is getting the tools to learn how to think uh, rather than necessarily what to think. And so although I'm not a biologist, uh, I have read The Selfish Gene. I did take high school and college biology. And uh, so, uh, you know, there, there's probably, uh, you know, a creationist out there who is a biologist who could argue me under the table on uh, on lots of things about evolution. I'll leave that for Dawkins to argue with them, right? Uh, yeah, same that's, here. Not, that's not my area, but I know enough to have an educated uh, opinion on things. Dan asks, uh, does Professor Irwin have any right of center atheist philosophers he would recommend? Wow, uh, right of center uh, atheist philosophers. Well, I mean, I, I certainly uh, know contemporary uh, philosophers, at least philosophy professors. Uh, I mean, it, 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 it's, yeah, it, it is right of center is tough. There, there are any number of libertarians, if you want to consider libertarians, uh, what, if that's what you mean, right of center. But, but I'm sort of blanking on, someone who would be really more in the traditional conservative camp, uh, who's also an atheist, but I'm, I'm sure that they're out there. And do you know what that means too, for any of our AFL members who are conservatives, who are, who identify as conservatives, who have, who are interested in philosophy or who are in academia, this is your time to speak up. 
because uh, there's a uh, there's a big hole that you can fill. Um, I would argue it's not as large as our critics would say. Oh, there's no such there's no conservative uh, secular right of center philosophers. I, I, there absolutely are, but they don't you know come across to me right away. Same same right. with you. Um, right. And that that means we need more of our members and more of our volunteers and more of our thinkers um, to step up, get involved. You know, it's time for the next generation to really kick in, millennials, Gen Z. Very good. Casey Dinger asks, how much did James Burnham and his works influence Dr. Irwin's views, if at all? Wow. I, I can confidently say not at all, because uh, I have to plead ignorance and say I'm not familiar with James Burnham. Uh, are you familiar with him, Thomas? I am not, actually. Okay. Well, that, that's a little bit of homework for me. I'm, uh, I'm writing Same. it down on a, on a post-it note here, and I'm going to look up James Burnham. And, uh, Same here. Not only, that, not only that, um, I watched uh, – this is another meme moment where we could just crop this out. Um, we can, uh, we can, uh, and we can, uh, we can maybe actually have an episode on this. Want to really quick, make one quick shout out. I, I said in the beginning of the stream, I'll say it uh, again. Our member of the week is Michael Inaska. Be like Michael, everybody. And please become a member at atheistliberty.org today. It is $1 a month billed at $12 a year. And we also have monthly levels. Michael gives per month. And we have other members who give per, uh, who give as well per month. And one of the benefits is actually we name you uh, on our streams. If you give uh, $10 a month or more or give monthly, um, we want to reward you for financially supporting us. We really appreciate any and all support that all of you can give. Um, it really means a lot. And also, um, if you upgrade your memberships for any of our existing members to higher tiers, we will be sure to reward you for that and to really uphold what we're trying to do here at AFL. I'll also make another announcement, although we can get into this more in eight minutes when we conclude the show. Dr. Irwin has spoken about his books. Um, for any of you who are interested in either getting a membership or upgrading your memberships, if you become a $20 a month member or higher, you get a signed copy of a book of your choice from any member of our board of advisors. I will also be sure to make sure that includes Dr. Irwin's books. If any of you are interested in obtaining a book from Dr. Irwin himself, please email info at atheistforliberty.org or contact AFL via any of our social media pages, and we will be sure to get the information straight to Dr. Irwin himself. Because this has already been a fantastic conversation. I've been reading over the live chat, kind of that's why my eyes have kind of been, you know, glancing at the side here and there because already this has been a very entertaining stream and the membership i think is uh can, can speak very highly of it um so again if any of you are interested in dr Irwin's work i want to do our very best to make sure that we platform him and platform everything he's accomplished so again contact us if you want a copy of his book let us know and please sign so up here, or upgrade here's your the free market existentialist and i've got uh copies from the publisher that uh we're able to give away and if you contact Thomas, uh, I guess first come, first serve, and and certainly signing up for uh, membership and uh, and higher uh, priority membership. Absolutely, and Jenny, uh, we will find a way to get your copy back to Doctor Irwin. Maybe if we, maybe uh, Doctor, if we ever invite you out to any uh, in person events, we can get you to sign a few copies yourselves. I, we would love to hand them out to members. Great, I'd be glad to. So we'll go on for a few more minutes and then we'll conclude the show. So we have another question. Here we go. Here we go. Bum, bum, bum. Rune of the Gods asks, to Bill Irwin, what do you find unsophisticated about Rand? I found the John Galt speech to be illuminating. I'd even go as far as to call the, it the most important piece of 20th century literature. Yeah, no, I, I love Atlas Shrugged and the John Galt speech uh, is maybe a little long, but uh, it, it is uh very illuminating uh and it, it's it's not the novels i think the novels uh do a great job of putting forward her uh her defense of uh, of the free market and uh the uh the philosophy that she has i i, I just don't and she had said early in her uh, writing career that she wasn't going to 
try to explain our novels or explain the philosophy behind them, but then that's precisely uh, what she did. And uh, again, uh, she had uh, an undergraduate degree in philosophy and is certainly uh, a, you know, a sophisticated thinker, but it, it's kind of uh, the pitfall of trying to do uh, work outside of one's own area of expertise where uh, it's certainly excellent for an amateur, uh, but nonetheless, it's the work of an amateur in the best sense of the word, someone who, who loves it, uh, but uh, isn't, you know, fully uh, educated in the, uh, uh, what would you say, the, uh, the techniques and the, uh, uh, the methodologies. So that, that's all I really mean by, by unsophisticated. Uh, it, it certainly comes across that way to uh, people who are not sympathetic to her. And, and I just kind of wish she had uh, left it at, uh, at uh, Atlas Shrugged in the Fountainhead. I already know of a bunch of libertarian and Rand supporting and objectivist atheists who would even uh, disagree with you on that. This is just an amazing idea that came across in my head. Maybe we could have a debate one day. We're, we're probably going to be, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if very soon we get Ayn Rand uh, type atheists from, uh, from like the Ayn Rand Institute. Um, you know, we're probably, spoiler alert, I'm going to be contacting Yarn Brooks soon and a bunch of other people uh, to eventually come on the stream. We'll have them as guests. And maybe we could even, if there are certain issues that we as free thinking atheists who support atheists or really disagree on, Maybe we can have some friendly debates on the channel. We can platform uh, platform you, platform somebody that might disagree with you who agrees with us on a different matter, mm -hmm. and uh, boom, that'll be some some more amazing content for all of you to see. Great. Frank asks, are you ever afraid you might lose your position as a professor due to not being on board enough with the woke ideas so many colleges force their staff to teach? Well, I mean, I, I, I've been fortunate, as I say, and maybe my, uh, my experience isn't uh, indicative of, of most people's, but I mean, I am tenured. So at, at, at this point, I mean, I, I could potentially be fired, I suppose, uh, for, uh, I, I mean, using a racial epithet or uh, groping a student or, I mean, those kind. Uh, you know th those kind of things. It's not that I that I have absolute guarantee of uh, employment, but uh, I, I really uh, nobody's going to make me put pronouns in my email uh, uh, signature, that kind of thing, and and nobody uh, has tried to get me to uh, include you know more minorities or something like that on my intro philosophy syllabus. That kind of thing. Well, that already uh, means you're transphobic and a racist. <laughs> trouble, trouble. I, yeah, right. So maybe I'm I'm too much of a lost cause for them even to come at. I don't I don't know, but uh, I, I I I don't live uh, I don't live in that kind of fear, thankfully. And, and honestly, we do need more professors in modern academia, regardless of what type of university or college you teach at, to be public about your to be public about not only the atheism parts, but but the non woke parts, the 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 ability to, you know, not abide by this toxic religion and still have the passion to want to teach others and to educate others in an environment where debate and disagreement is encouraged. Um, and I, this is why I love platform. Most of the people who who we've platformed so far in the streaming series have backgrounds in academia, and it it makes me feel pretty good that there are still people who have a yearning to want to educate people and still are in a position where they haven't been fired yet um, to uh, to just do what's right. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's more difficult. Uh, there's, there's such a self-selection process. I mean, it's very difficult for people who are in graduate school or very early in their uh, their career where they really do, uh, if, if they want to survive uh, to the point where, where they get tenure, have to rub the, uh, the zombie guts on themselves a little bit. Uh, and certainly not be a, a, a real firebrand uh, about things. Right. Uh, so, yeah. So I think um, we will end it here, folks. I want to really state to all of you that this series is really progressing quite a lot. We're getting more and more suggestions 
for by each and every one of you as to who we should platform on the channel. The audience is growing. The anticipation is growing. So everybody, if you haven't liked and subscribed and clicked the notification bell um, on this channel, please, please, please do so. Um, this channel is growing every single day, and if you guys do hit that notification bell every single time we go live or every single time we upload a video, you guys will be the first ones to see it. And we're going to be reviewing comments, too. Uh, I'm going to be making videos on the channel, for instance, reviewing each of your comments, not only live stream comments, but video comments after the streams become recordings. And we're going to also be clipping out uh, portions of these streams to turn into later recordings. I, we just uploaded a clip of James Lindsay. Um, from one of the old streams we did with him back in late 2021, it got 2,000 views. Just the clip, guys. Imagine what content we could get here. I find I found this stream to be very entertaining, very memeable too. So uh, I bet you that that we're going to be benefiting, and all of you are going to be benefiting as well with more content and more support coming our way. Um, again, want to state it again, and I state it every time at the beginning of the show. Not only. Do we want to defend enlightenment values as this organization, but we want to learn from the greatest minds of the 21st century. I think that Dr. William Irwin counts as one of those greatest minds, and I really do appreciate you, sir, for coming on the show. Well, I, I can't accept that compliment of being one of the greatest minds, but I do appreciate it, and I do appreciate the invitation. And it's been a fun conversation, and uh, I look forward to hearing from folks uh, who are, are watching and tuning in and uh you know, uh, any, anybody who gets a chance to read The Free Market Existentialist or anything, I always consider a book as a conversation starter and not a conversation ender. And so I look forward to hearing from people who uh, who disagree or find something missing or, or whatever else. So thanks again for having me. Absolutely. All right, everybody, that's our show. Tune in. Every single Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, we're going to be platforming more people on this channel and making sure that we really abide by our tagline of free speech, free thinking, and freedom for all. That's a wrap, everybody. Have a great evening.